Recording in progress. Um, I'm sorry I'm late. Um, <clears throat> so welcome everyone to the March 9th, 2023 school committee meeting. In keeping with an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during a state of emergency, signed into law by Governor Baker on June 16th, 2021, this meeting will be conducted remotely over Zoom. Attendance by board members will be remote and attendance shall count towards quorum. The meeting will be broadcast live on Facebook and recorded on ECAT. This meeting is open to the public and will take questions via the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure to include your full name and address. We'll do our best to answer questions. However, we will not read questions that have already been answered. All right. So personnel change, retirements of an English teacher at Oliver Ames High School, a grade six teacher at Easton Middle School and a paraprofessional at Richardson Olmstead. Dr. Cabral. Thank you, I'll read them in that order. So unfortunately, the first uh, retiree is unable to join us this evening, but uh, Joanne Kaufman is a current English teacher and department chair at Oliver Ames High School. She came to Easton in 1999 as a part-time teacher at what was then the Easton Junior High School for ninth grade. Right away in 2000, she started full-time and was transferred to Oliver Ames High School as an English teacher. As I said, became the department chair for grades seven through 12. Over the years has served as a mentor, has served as the ADL advisor for our ADL program at the high school. Um, she has just contributed in so many ways to the Oliver Ames um, community, the culture building, um, the environment. She has been a valuable resource to the administration as well as her colleagues and students. And she plans to retire at the end of this school year. She has a total years of service of 24 years. So this is a, a very important position that has been done very well by Ms. Kaufman for quite a long time and once again represents a very significant loss to the district, but we certainly wish her well in her uh, well-earned retirement and know that she will be doing some very fun and interesting things, we're sure. Dear Alicia, <clears throat> after a 20 plus teaching career at um, Oliver Ames High School, I am informing you that I'll be retiring at the end of the 2022-2023 school year. As I step away from a rewarding career of helping students, teachers, and administrators create a safe and enriching learning environment in Easton, I will forever be grateful for all the opportunities and support you've all provided me throughout my career. I will remember fondly the positive collegial community within the English department, leadership teams, and the staff at OA and EMS. As advisor to the ADL Peer Leader Program, I've had the opportunity to work with students <clears throat> who want to help increase the awareness of differences in personal and group identities. I want to take this moment to thank the community for its goals of promoting diversity and equity. Sincerely, Joanne Kaufman. Anybody have a comment? Nancy? Thank you. <clears throat> I spoke, spoke with Joanne this afternoon about something different, but uh, I asked her, I said, are you gonna be at the meeting? She goes, no, I'm too emotional. I said, don't tell me about that, I'll get emotional. But anyway, Joanne's been uh, there all the time. I remember when they were doing the, um, the uh, when the high school gets accredited, she was a, a major force in accreditation working with Mr. Paul. Also, her she was the field hockey coach at Oliver Ames for a while and uh, their team, I, I wanted, I'm gonna probably get the year wrong, but I, I forget what year it was, but uh, unbelievable. They they did a great job. They almost won like the South or something like that, but she was a great coach and uh, the kids loved her. So she is definitely going to be missed at OA and actually throughout all of Eastern Public Schools. So uh, another, another big one to uh, find a good replacement for. I don't know if she could be replaced, but good luck, Joanne, you're, you're awesome. Caroline? Got to unmute myself. Um, you know, 
All Rams High School has had a reputation uh, of having outstanding English teachers, and I know that when um, our youngsters go to college, the colleges report back that their writing skills are exceptional. Um, and I think that Joanne is one of those teachers that has certainly contributed a great deal to that, well, it's not just a perception, that reality that uh, we've, <clears throat> I think, for actually decades, but certainly in recent years, done a really great job with uh, <clears throat> such an important skill, which is, you know, English, reading, writing, it's just so critical. So uh, I, I hope that uh, Joanne experiences a wonderful retirement, but I'm certainly sorry to see her go. Jen? Um, so Mrs. Kaufman is actually my youngest son's advisory teacher. So he's had that relationship with her for the past three years. I know the, the kids are disappointed that they'll not, you know, have her through their graduation in 2024, um, but, you know, understand that retirement is calling. But I have to uh, really commend um, with this grade, their first year at OA started off with that hybrid model. So to be able to build community among a group of students who were young, new to high school, and half in person and, and half at home and, and to build that um, that advisory community under those circumstances was really challenging. She absolutely rose to the challenge and it was one of those really important the day and, and just a source of consistent community and, and fellowship and fun and relaxation and at you know uh, conference nights definitely one of the one of the rooms they stopped by and kind of think well why do you need to go see the advisory teacher but you know um it was just really neat to kind of hear about how she works so hard to make sure that the kids have that welcome safe kind of fun relax they get the information that they need you know it's it's their kind of home you know she just you know snacks and jokes and and fun activities to get the kids to um, to know each other, so I definitely appreciate that, and it was uh, I was glad that you know my son was able to have the experience of somebody um, who just had such a, a great approach to making that happen. Nancy, Michelle, if I can, one more thing. What Jen was when Jen was talking, I forgot I had it written down. She's the master of graduation. Oh my gosh, those kids get in their seats. She tells them where to go, and they're all. <laughs> She's like, I don't know, you're going to have to replace an English teacher and a graduation advisor person. So she does it all and she will be missed. Thank you, oh. Michelle. And so many more things. I honestly, <clears throat> I, I started to um, name some things and then realized I'm going to leave a lot out. She's just involved in so many activities and so many extracurriculars and devotes so much time outside of school. Um, you're right. It's it's, it's going to be a lot to fill. I can just also add that she just has such a connection with kids. Um, I, I loved watching her in her canoe in the um, OA Olympiad uh, during COVID. <laughs> uh, she just always had a great way of connecting. She always has a great way of connecting with kids, and I know that um, that will be missed. All right. Thank you. So I would like to make a motion to accept the retirement of Joanne Kaufman with regrets. Can I get a second? Second with reg regret, DeLuca. All right, roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. All right, thank you and good luck to her. Enjoy. Dr. Cabral. Thanks. Um, Nancy, hold on. If that was emotional, I don't know what's going to happen here. So, uh, Mrs. Sharon Stearns, grade six math and science teacher at Easton Middle School. Mrs. Stearns came to Easton in 2003 as a grade six teacher at what was then the FL Olmsted School. Um, eventually, grade six, of course, moved to the middle school and Mrs. Stearns transferred to EMS in her same position. Over the course of the years, she has also served as um, not the department chair equivalent, but a very, very important role as curriculum leader. Um, 
in the district uh, for math and served on the sixth grade math assessment development committee for the new MCAS 2.0. Just a true lover of the subject matter and, and really very good at it. Um, she intends to retire in June after 20 years in the district. And again, losing a, uh, a tremendous colleague, someone who has been a resource not only to stu Oh, there she is, hello. <laughs> someone who has not only been a resource to uh, a tremendous resource to students, but also to her colleagues and to the administration and very big shoes to fill. But again, you can't help but be really excited for someone um, who has so much energy and so much life and just is really going to enjoy in retirement. And so um, we are very sad to see Sharon go, but certainly wish her many, many long, happy, healthy years in her retirement and know she'll really uh, enjoy herself. Oh, Michelle, you're muted. Sorry. See, if I don't read it out loud, she can't go. Okay. <laughs> Resume mute. Yep. <laughs> it is with mixed emotions that I write my retirement letter effective June 2023. While new adventures await me, I have truly loved working in Easton and will truly miss the students, faculty, and staff. I came to Easton after being laid off from another district and never looked back because of the collegial student-centered support culture I found here. In addition, I was provided outstanding professional development opportunities not often found in many districts. Through the curriculum leadership program and supportive administrators, these opportunities to help me improve my pedagogy, uh, support my colleagues and improved student learning. I truly appreciate these many opportunities afforded me through my career in Easton. Working in Easton has been an honor and an indisputable pleasure. Although retiring is bittersweet for me, I'm leaving my position as educator is difficult. I'm excited for all the possibilities that the future holds. Best regards, Sharon Stearns. Did anybody have a comment, Nancy? Of course. Hi, Sharon. Congratulations. You're gonna love retirement. Just know it takes about a year to get used to it. Um, Sharon at the middle school was a fourth in the sixth grade, a double four. She's amazing. Um, and, you know, last meeting, um, you accepted Margie Poland's retirement and now Sharon's. So good luck, people, finding good math teachers and science teachers to help our sixth graders move along in, in the school world. Um, Sharon's been awesome. I, I kind of was, when she signed up to do MCATS questions with the state, I was like, what? <laughs> that I am like no way but she was awesome and she helped us you know even the seventh and eighth grade teachers at the time excuse me helped us with that whole math process we had a lot of pg with sharon so it was awesome so congratulations i'm very happy for you caroline I'll just say quickly that Sharon is one of those teachers whose excellent reputation certainly precedes her every year. Parents are always so excited that uh, their children are going to have an opportunity to learn under her very skilled leadership. So congratulations on your retirement. But again, I wish you were not leaving us. <laughs> Sharon, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything before I motion no okay can i chime in please i was waiting for the uh, committee absolutely so i've i've had the pleasure of working with sharon as a curriculum leader and i don't know if it was right before covid or right after covid so sharon you'll have to um to to uh to get me right on the time frame but here's a here's a, a wonderful teacher who's towards the end of her career and she discovers a new way to teach math and it was magical the way that you know she just studied this she went on um you know uh facebook pages to learn more about it and she taught our curriculum leaders about this new way of teaching sharon has always been somebody that has stayed so um current in her practice and it's she is a huge loss for us i will miss her terribly 
her leadership, her thoughtfulness. So thank you so much, Sharon, for all that you've done. Thank you. Very humbling. <laughs> okay, I would like to make a motion oh, then. Ms. Michelle, I'm consumed, with I'm consumed with curiosity now. Is there any Mrs. chance, Way? Sharon, that you could give us the very short version of what this new way of math entails? Would you mind? Sure. So it's um, built on probably 15 years of research. Um, it's called Building a Thinking Classroom. And it, the premise behind it is that to improve engagement for all students, because as a student is sitting at the desk working, which you're hoping they're working, um, research is sort of showing that they're not fully engaged. Um, so standing at a whiteboard or something that they can, um, it's first of all, they're standing and they're working in a group and they're talking math all the time while they're doing that. Um, and as a teacher, you can sort of stand back and watch my, right now I've got eight groups um, and they're fully engaged the whole time. They're talking math, um, flexible thinking, reaching higher levels. Um, and it's just amazing. And I still, even this weekend was watching another um, by the author of the book, I was watching um, another video that he had put out. He was um, presented at the National Math Conference, and it was recorded, and here I am still watching it. I don't know what I'm going to do with this knowledge, um, uh, but I just feel like I just can't get enough of it. So who knows where my future is? Thank you so much, and I will share that I actually have a, uh, a daughter who is a sixth grade science teacher in Connecticut, mm -hmm. but it sounds like this is a, a sort of an approach that would be applicable to any topic. Um, it is, actually, and science science is starting to tag onto it. Um, it started with math, There's that, and I guess there are more books being written, um, and science is the first one to tag onto with the math. Well, I thank you kindly for indulging my curiosity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. I would like to make a motion to accept the retirement of Sharon Stearns with regrets. Can I get a second? O'Neill, so moved, definitely with regret. Roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Lance, yes. Deluca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Congratulations, Sharon. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you for joining us. All right, Dr. Cabral. Thank you. So we now have uh, a paraprofessional. Kathy Papageras came to Easton in 2016 as a paraprofessional at Richardson Olmsted, where she continues today. She plans to retire in June. Uh, of this year at the end of the school year after seven years in the district. Um, Kathy is uh, a, a wonderful person, an excellent para. Um, I can't even believe it's already been seven years that <laughs> she's been here. But, um, but she, again, is another loss that we wish her very well in her retirement. Paraprofessionals, again, are those unsung hero sports that we have in our classrooms and um, certainly has done a tremendous job with our students and we're so grateful for her service and wish her very well in her retirement also. Dear Dr. Cabral, please accept this letter as my resignation for the purpose of retirement as a paraprofessional at Richardson Olmsted School. My last day of employment will be June 30th, 2023. I greatly appreciate the opportunities that the school has provided me, as well as the um, professional guidance and support. Respectively, Catherine, Catherine Papa, girl, Papageris. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Catherine Papageris. Any comments? Okay, is she here? No. Unfortunately, she's not. Well, I would like to make a motion to accept the retirement letter of Catherine Papagiris. Can I get a second? Star, second. With regret. 
Roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Weissman, yes. Star, yes. All right, thank you. And good luck to her as well. Great. Next is <clears throat> vote to approve the Easton Middle School Student Handbook for 2022-2023. Dr. Cabral. Thank you. This has the, as you know, the, the handbook has been reviewed by the school committee already. Handbooks must go through the uh, parent, uh, excuse me, the school advisory council, which of course parents are on. And that process has happened and this was brought before you. There was, were some requested uh, edits or areas to look at. And Mr. Carroll and Ms. Santos are here this evening to review those adjustments with you. Uh, I do have one recommended adjustment as well, and then it's up for consideration for your vote so that they can um, implement this immediately. Mr. Carroll? Uh, before I get started, while Sharon's still here, I wanna wish Sharon congratulations. Um, she's okay. truly irreplaceable. She's been uh, uh, at the middle school since, it, you know, obviously since it became the middle school. Uh, I've worked almost a majority of my career in Easton with her and uh, it's been a true blessing. Uh, she's the ultimate professional and it's been uh, an amazing run. Uh, we will not find another Sharon Stearns that I'm aware of, but if we can find somebody close, uh, we'll take that. So congratulations, Sharon. You certainly deserve uh, a wonderful retirement and we're definitely gonna miss you. That was great timing. Yeah, the, um, the handbook, um, I'll go forward. We. Uh, we implemented uh, the changes that were suggested uh, the last time that I was here. I brought that back to our school council and we voted on that. Um, and I'll present uh, not all the, uh, not everything that, that I've had presented the first uh, couple times, uh, but just the suggested changes. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and then I'll go from there. Okay, the first suggested change that we had was uh, was on page 11. We switched um, uh, the area that uh, is at the end of the first paragraph to uh, inappropriate dress, including the following. Um, so we changed some of the language and uh, we also changed some of the language in section E. So those suggested changes uh, made by school committee, we move forward and the school council approved those. Um, also on page, oops, sorry about that, on page 18, Um, on page 18, uh, we also cleaned up some of the language uh, and now it says uh, superintendent or designee may refer a student to law enforcement in the event of an act of vandalism, destruction of property or breaking and entering or other criminal acts. Um, we also made a change um, on page 22 um, because uh, originally we had the right address, but uh, with the opening of Blanche Ames, uh, we had to uh, change the address for the superintendent's office. Um, so we changed that to 48 Spooner Street. And while we're in there, although it wasn't necessarily a, re a recommended change, I think coming out of school committee, we realized that we wanted to clean up uh, some of the language regarding our accelerated math program and lay out exactly what was the criteria for that. Um, so we did go back in um, um, on page uh, 22, I'm sorry. And we added in some language for our accelerated math program in grade seven and grade eight um, of what we use to sort of make that selection. I think that's all the suggested changes that I had from the last time that I was at the school committee. So we've, uh, we've made those changes. And as I said, the school council has voted on those changes. Um, so we're ready to move forward with any suggestions. 
Anyone on the committee have a question, comment? I can't see you all, so Jen. Okay, Jen. Um, so I think I think there were. It looks like there were some changes also made in the medical. You froze, Jen. That we brought up. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. No. Okay. Uh, looks like there were some edits made to the medication section. There, there was, but all I have highlighted is the in the guidelines section. I believe it's page twenty-five. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Carroll, could you please go to um, page 38? I apologize. Which page? 38. Perfect, thanks. So uh, this section, just for, for the school committee's information, this section has to do with um, 37H, which are regulations that have to do with possession of uh, drugs, um, weapons, or assault. And um, while the information was not, is not incorrect, it was written by legal counsel, DESE has recently provided some updated guidance on this. So I did actually speak with legal counsel, Mr. Carroll, just so you know, and if you go back down to page 38, um, after number five, um, there is a little bit of modification that they recommend to update this. And since you're doing this, it's the perfect opportunity to update a little bit of the language. So uh, for example, the referring to short short term suspension pending a hearing to consider expulsion is now uh, emergency removal pending a hearing to consider expulsion. So uh, I did ask her to review this and she is going to be sending you some updated information for that introductory paragraph that says when considering the expulsion of a student and the language for A, B and C. So for the school committee's benefit, that's simply going to be an update to the legal language based on some um, DESE recent advice in that area. And you, if you have no other objections to the handbook itself elsewhere, you can vote on this pending the insertion of the legal language once they get it, uh, which should be forthcoming quite soon. The only other thing I would say is that once you get that le legal language, Mr. Carroll, to just make sure that any templates for letters that you send, make sure that the, the language mirrors it. And if you aren't certain, of course, you can always send it for a quick legal review to make sure that it does mirror the language that you're given. But mostly it's for the um, short term suspension language to be emergency removal language. And we'll make sure we get that language for you just to make sure it's accurate. Yeah, I believe we have already updated uh, all of our uh, all of our letters or any any uh, any suspension items that go out. Um, okay, but uh, but typically, like a section like this is something that um, you know the school uh, the school attorney would provide uh, guidance on yep. before we push out. Absolutely. So we'll make sure we get you that, and with the insertion of that, um, the school committee can elect to, to vote for it this evening if you if you have no objections to other sections. Anyone on the committee, a question, a comment? I don't think I see anybody. Okay, so <clears throat> then I'm gonna make a motion to accept the Easton Middle School Parent Student Handbook 2022-2023 um, with the noted um, language changes that are coming for page 38. Do I have a second? Star second. Roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. Luca, yes. Weissman, yes. Star, yes. All right, thank you. And, and thank just you. to note quickly for, again, for the school committee, the advice that was given by Desi 
that's just advice for the entire state. It wasn't something specific to Easton or because we had any particular issue. It's just updated guidance to the entire Commonwealth that we wanna um, make sure we're updated. Great, thank you. Thank you, have a great night. Thank you, you Mr. Barrett. Yeah. Blanche A. Ames Elementary School Solar Update. Dr. Cabral. Thank you. So one of the uh, design considerations of the new elementary school was to make sure that the roof was uh, designed to be solar ready so that um, we didn't add solar arrays immediately because the town had actually reached its limit for solar credits. We have recently um, re-examined this and with the help of the town administrator um, and the town accountant, and our finance director, Andrea Starzewski, we had a meeting and determined that we are eligible again for solar. And so we are gonna move ahead with investigating with, um, with a solar advisor, and we met with the advisor already, to have solar panels, solar arrays installed on the roof of Blanche Ames. So right now we're getting the information um, for example, how solar ready is the building? Is it just structurally or have the conduits been run? Uh, how many arrays can we have on the building? Now, just in the amount of time, and I'm sure you can imagine this to be true, just in the amount of time that we added the solar panels to the middle school and high school, and now there have already been great advances in the arrays. So we actually will have um, the each individual array will actually take up less square footage of the roof and produce more energy. So it is far more efficient. I think we're going from like 330s to 480s. This is also gonna be a little bit different because we're gonna have a behind the meter installation. The difference is that EMS and OA actually plug right into the grid. So that energy goes back into the grid and we get a credit toward our energy consumption this will actually go into Blanche Ames. So we'll be using the energy from the solar arrays for Blanche Ames. Any additional will go into the grid. It will be at a reduced rate, but we can use it for credits for the other buildings as well. So this is, again, just really trying to look at all of the areas that we can not only create in uh, energy efficiency and be environmentally friendly, but also that we can, um, sorry, we still have workers here in the building, <laughs> still trying to get it all put together, uh, where we can uh, reduce our footprint, be environmentally conscious, but also save money. Like we're saving money right now by shutting off Ms. Gruick lights. Look at that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So, uh, so we are very excited about this development. Uh, I did, we did of course make sure that, you know, how is this going to, to happen? The, the company act, we are not gonna own the solar arrays. The company will own the arrays. We will have, um, we will have <laughs> professional punters, like I say all the time. We will have uh, leases drawn up. So we're actually leasing the real estate on, on the top of the building to the companies. The companies will own, install, maintain, and repair all of the arrays. We've also asked, we're, we're asking specifically for really a minimal penetration of the, the roof itself so that we don't have any issues with that. But the, the vendor is responsible for that and would be responsible for any of the um, any repairs that might be necessary, which we have had success with the other buildings. Things have been going very well with the arrays that we have at the middle school and the high school, and we are realizing efficiencies. We are also very interested in just kind of increasing the coverage for uh, snow removal, because again, that's something we do not do. We do not touch the arrays. We are leasing that space. We don't want to have anything to do with the arrays because they are, um, they take care of all of that. So we can ensure that that's not an additional cost for the school system. And finally, there's this wonderful educational piece that comes with it where we have a screen inside the school and then we can teach children about the 
uh, conservation of energy as well as using natural energy. We ca they can see the energy input that's happening. They can see the output to the grid and it creates some nice lessons for the students about, um, about solar arrays and, and how they generate energy for our building. This is not uh, a vote or anything that you need to consider tonight. I just wanted to bring it to your attention that we are working with the town on this. And as we develop any further information, of course, we'll bring it to you and um, keep you up to date on this um, exciting development that really I didn't expect it this uh, soon, but it's very exciting that it's happening. We'll look for any way that we can to, uh, and it, you know, it's all from the same budget. Any money that we save in energy, we can target directly to students and staff. And certainly reducing our footprint is something that we're very conscious and of, redu of doing responsibly. That's exciting. Anybody have a question about that? Comment? Okay. Uh, public comment? I don't think there is any. Do you see anything, Fred? No. No. Superintendent notes, Dr. Cabral? Um, I can confirm that we are going to have uh, a speaker coming into the district. It's kind of an exciting development. We, we're still facing the challenge of student vaping. Uh, while we've been able to really minimize cigarette use in our youngsters uh, in this country, really, uh, vaping still has this, this elevated stature. Um, we're finding that even parents feel like it's a safer alternative for themselves or for students. And it's very difficult to combat something that is so readily available that uh, fortunately in Massachusetts, students or, or consumers aren't able to get it in flavors anymore. So it's not quite as attractive in that way to children or young adults, but they certainly can go relatively short distances to get that. And we are finding that it's different and students are getting addicted to the nicotine um, in them. So we're really trying to find any method we can to help educate not only the community and parents, but our students as well, as we do see a slight increase in vaping use um, each year. This is one of the reasons why the health um, behavior survey that we do with students in grades seven to 12 is so important because it helps, <laughs> excuse me, it really helps us capture this information and it helps us target where we need to do more of our education interven intervention and cessation programs. So one of the um, speakers we've been able to bring in, he's coming on April 24th and 25th. His name is Daryl Green. He is a uh, former football player for in the professional league at the NFL for Washington. He is um, has the still has the nickname the Ageless Wonder. Uh, Mr. Green is a Hall of Famer. He is a Super Bowl winner. He was known as the fastest man in the NFL and uh, is quite a dynamic personality. He has committed his retirement to really stopping vaping in students and student athletes. And, you know, we've, we've done a lot of great work with the 84, the student group that has presented to this committee and presented to our legislative delegation. We have done a lot of work inside school, outside school, and um, what we're hearing and, and learning from things like the survey is that the, the vaping is prevalent among athletes as well. And so we thought we would try to, to take a different angle here and have uh, a, a professional athlete come and speak with all of the students, both at the middle school and the high school about the dangers of vaping and how it can really affect your performance in your life. He has a, a, a pep rally format. And so he'll be at Oliver Ames on the 24th. He will be presenting to the kids and then he'll spend time with them during all of their lunch shifts so he can have more informal interactions, answer any questions they might have. He brings his Hall of Fame coat and his Super Bowl rings and, and really uh, engages with the kids in fun and interesting ways. He's then going to meet with the uh, athletes after school at Oliver Ames. Um, he's hoping for good weather so he can get out on the field, throw the ball around with the kids and have some conversations with them in an in a even more informal 
environment, and then he's going to repeat his program at the middle school the next day, the 25th, all except for the after school component. So we're fortunate to have him here for two days. His program usually is a day long, but we've got two days and the after school component, and, and we're very pleased that he is um, bringing this program to Massachusetts. We are the first in Massachusetts to have him here uh, presenting this program, and uh, he just left Virginia and some um, other um, southern states, and um, we're looking forward to the students um, giving us their feedback about the visit, and hopefully, you know, he has a three-minute video about his career, and um, it's pretty exciting, so we look forward to having him here. Also this week, um, Jen Starr fortunately was able to join us. We had our legislative breakfast for the Mass Association of School Superintendents. We are thick into budget season. The H1 House 1 budget, <coughs> excuse me, from the governor's office came out. And unfortunately, it is uh, disappointing. Um, you know, there's been a lot of growth in the state in the last um, four to six years, 38% uh, growth in the state. But yet the unrestricted government aid is uh, hovering at um, 2%. If we add the percent we're receiving, we subtract the assessments from the town and include the minimum aid contribution that we get for, for schools, which is $30 per student, we have a net increase this year from the state of $129,000. And that is, that's the town, that's not the school. So we, uh, I was fortunate to present with two of my colleagues from, uh, from Massachusetts, two superintendents from Norton and North Attleboro, to talk about some of our legislative priorities uh, and in ways that we feel there's legislative action that can directly benefit the education of our students through, whether it's through the um, full, um, the full uh, payment of circuit breaker, uh, support of charter school payments. Uh, we discussed the fact that the operational services division set an increase of out of district special education services of 14%. Now, just as a, um, just as a comparison, the average increase from OSD for, for that has been uh, hovering around 2% for just under one to just over two for an average of two over the last several years. In fact, over the last um, decade, the increase has been just over 15% for every year combined. And this year alone in FY24, it's going up 14%. Now out, out of district expenditures, even though it's a small number of students, it can be very costly. It represents, in FY23, our out-of-district represents 9% of our entire $45 million budget. So 9% of our budget is going to increase right next year by 14%. We also have increases in our transportation costs. We also have um, level service needs that are going to be costly this year because we have the fortunate benefit of having an increase in enrollment in pre-K and grade kindergarten, but that means we have to open up more classrooms. That's level service because we're still providing pre-K education, we just have to do it for more students. We've had this pervasive, pervasive issue with English learners or what we're coining, um, because it's more accurate, multilingual learners in our district. When I started here, we had less than 60 students who were multilingual learners. We now, this week, have over uh, 105. This, uh, as you know, has already been an underfunded area and we don't have enough educators, but with the influx of students even this year, we need to add at least one multilingual educator. It's level service, but it's an increased cost. That combined with our contractual obligation increases and other areas in the budget that just increase with the rate of inflation, 
you can see why $129,000 from the straight state is just completely insufficient. So we did uh, provide documentation, data, statistics to our legislature, legislators. We appreciate all the representatives and senators that took time out of their day to meet with us. We met in Brockton and uh, sent them on their way with our packages with the promise to follow up, which you know we will, and making sure that we pursue these bills, we pursue these efforts, we pursue these requests so that we can find some relief uh, in Easton where we're not a district that benefits from the Student Opportunity Act or the foundation formula. Unfortunately, the narrative in the press and the newspapers online is that the schools are kind of all set and maybe don't need to benefit from the fair share tax or benefit in other ways uh, from the, from the uh, growth in the state because we have the Student Opportunity Act. But we are a minimum aid district. And minimum aid this year, again, was it was set at $60 last year and it's set at $30 this year. That's just over a $100,000 increase. And so that is insufficient obviously, to, to continue running oper operationally without making significant cuts. So we're hoping that at, as, the, as the budget is now reviewed and um, goes through its several iterations, that our House and Senate representatives will be putting forward some of these requests and we can make some adjustments to the budget. Um, otherwise, it is, it's looking rather bleak. And so um, we're really working with them cooperatively. They were a, a very kind and generous audience yesterday. They've been very supportive of us, of us in the past. We're hoping that even with um, what are relatively smaller requests of the state, like moving the minimum aid from $30 per student to $100 per student, taking another look at the wage adjustment factor formula, that these things we're really pressing for are things that can make a difference for us. So. Um, we never expect to get everything in one year, but even incremental in, um, changes will help us in the long run. So we did have that breakfast this week, and um, hopefully it's helpful. We certainly will follow up with that. Um, <clears throat> I think that's all I have for right now, but Mrs. Pruitt usually reminds me of something when she does her notes, so I, I will circle back if that happens tonight. All right. And Michelle, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, Leisha, may I ask you a question? Uh, of course. You may not be prepared to answer this because there's no real reason for you to have guessed that I was going to ask this, but when you talk about um, the 14% increase for uh, out-of-district placements, but then you mentioned, of course, special ed transportation as well, that's in addition, correct, to yes. the, the placements themselves. Do you know um, what that just in general terms, that cost is at this point, the special education. Um, uh, transportation? Yeah, transportation, the, the vans, et cetera. Special education transportation is just under a million dollars. Okay. And um, circuit breaker last year was one, uh, $1.4 million. Um, what we're looking for is to increase circuit breaker reimbursement. Uh, first of all, it, we hope every year it's at 75%. It isn't always. But what we're hoping for is um, we're, we're asking for 90% reimbursement on Circuit Breaker. Um, as I explained to um, a legislator who asked a really great question of whether our special education rates have decreased over, over the time that the costs have increased, um, in Easton at least they have. However, you know, with, with advancements in technology and medicine, the very positive, uh, a very exciting development is that medically fragile children are surviving longer and thriving, but they do present with very complex medical conditions. We have a much higher rate of diabetes now than we ever have. We have a much higher rate of students who require one-to-one -one nursing assistance, um, we have our in-district programs for students and certainly endeavor in every way to make sure our kids stay with us in their home district, in their neighborhoods, with their friends. Um, and so that's where that circuit breaker uh, cost comes in um, to be very important is when we are unable to provide for students in district and they're outplaced 
um, the, the costs are so exorbitant. I shared one story about how, um, you know, there, there are just some, some medical conditions that are just too complex for us to be able to accommodate in the district. And so those are things that we've never seen before. Um, it's, it's wonderful that we have this opportunity to educate the students, but um, there are more complex cases now, which are more expensive. In addition, there are less resources. We have less um, mental health providers. We have less collaboratives that we can work with. And so we're finding that students are having to travel further. And so potentially students who are, um, who are a day uh, student and really don't need a residential placement, if they have to travel states to actually get to a place where they have an appropriate placement for their um, condition or their disability, they become a residential student. And that's, of course, a lot more expensive. So um, it's through a few things, the, the more com the complexity of the cases, also the um, lack of resources locally and um, and uh, the costs of these tuitions, which are just, as we've discussed, can get up to $250,000 plus per student per year. Um, and they're not, they can change without warning. Um, every year around this time, actually, so it's, it's around this time, every year we get letters from collaboratives or districts telling us our tuition is increasing by X amount and it starts four weeks from today. And so obviously the budget's already planned. Um, while I dread that every year, this year was really the gut punch when the OSD came out and said unilaterally it's a 14% increase. So that's something we certainly, no one ever anticipated and um, is, is costing districts millions of dollars. Um, it's gonna cost us about 1% of our operating budget. So we're, we're looking for um, what we presented to the legislator specifically for that short and long-term solutions. But a short-term solution is, though, is that even though the fair share tax has not been earmarked for any K-12 education, we're looking for a temporary pothole relief for this year to help districts make that adjustment. And um, it's gonna cost between 90 and $93 million. Um, but we're hoping that they are willing to invest that to help us with this unprecedented change. And then of course, more long-term uh, solutions include increasing the circuit breaker, um, reducing the threshold for circuit breaker, uh, different things that require legislative changes and further funding that are long-term funding. So we presented them with a couple of options and we're hoping that they'll go back and discuss them with their colleagues. Thank you. Assistant Superintendent Nate Kissy. So just to, just to start off, I do wanna share that, um, you know, as you know, Dr. Cabral is very humble and um, she stood in front of an audience of over close to 50, if not more than that, half of them legislatures and represented the South Shore Roundtable. Um, she stepped forward and, and agreed to do that when you know, just one of three of, of um, our community, of our roundtable that offered to, to do that and speak out on our behalf. And she represented Easton amazingly. So I just wanted to share that with, with the committee because it's important and I'm sure Jen will share that as well. Um, it's important that you know that, you know, here I am sitting looking going, wow, that was just dynamic. And the way she's able to articulate and, and share the concerns um, was really remarkable. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. She won't give okay, That was very credit, nice. So. And so she did <laughs> remind me of something going forward. Her comments are going to be edited before she's allowed to speak. Okay. Um, Thank so you, a, couple, a, couple, a couple things I just wanted to share with you. Um, we are just going full, full speed ahead with um, many, many things going on in the district around curriculum instruction um, and civil rights and, and various, various endeavors. So I just wanted to share some of that with you. First of all, I know that you know that we have a very robust mentor program in the district led by Kristen Morani. Um, we now have um, an elementary person that is 
helping Kristen lead uh, the group, and that is Alexis Alexa Murray. Um, Alexa Murray is a, or Martin now, she's a fabulous preschool teacher. Um, she was at the middle school as a special ed teacher and moved to the preschool and is fantastic and a wonderful compliment to Kristen. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I know that our teachers really rely on that, our new teachers, and Kristen does a phenomenal job of supporting our teachers, really trying to get to the bottom of what they need. Um, and she works really hard at matching our new teachers with, with mentor teachers. She also teaches a mentor course. So any teacher that to be a mentor, they have to go through the course once every five years in order to be kind of certified, but not officially certified to be a mentor. Um, so it's just, I just wanted to keep you updated just so you know that that's going on. Uh, another wonderful support for our, for our new teachers. It's also great for our for our seasoned teachers as well because they get to really share their their practice um, and it highlights a lot of a lot of the things that they do um, with the new teachers as well. Uh, we are also um, plugging away, um, as you know, we're with the adoption of our literacy program. Uh, we are meeting next week our liter literacy leadership team to create an actual an action plan for moving forward with implementation. Um, alongside with that, we have our, liter our literacy coaches and reading specialists that are working really hard to, th they're leading this work throughout the district. Um, Jeannie Baxter, our, reading co our, re our literacy specialist at the middle school, is actually um, going to be providing professional development to all of our teachers at OA, or most of our teachers at OA, around the science of reading. So, you know, th we're... we're we're making sure that every teacher within the district is understanding of what the science of reading is, understanding that this is the actual science of how to learn to read and um, you know what it looks like so that all of our teachers are on the same page and we continue um, we continue moving forward and, and making you know providing rigorous opportunities for our students at all times while also when students are struggling really understanding why they're struggling, but still ensuring that they have access to grade level material um, and, and all of that and that we're scaffolding um, to ensure that, that our students are, are presented with, with rigorous opportunities, um, but their needs are being met as well. Um, and also Cindy Olson, our reading specialist for FOA at James and Karen Daly, our literacy coach at Richardson Olmstead, will be providing professional development for our PK through five paras um, in a couple weeks so that they understand the science of reading at their grade levels. Um, so we're really, we're really excited about their continued leadership and I thank them tremendously for that. Um, you know, there was, I, I had a parent actually uh, this week send me a video. There's a new documentary out around, it's called The Right to Read. Um, there was a showing that actually, I think it ended today. So I was able to, I could, I trouble logging in and she kept sending me um, different links. So I was able to watch it today. And it really just talks about um, the injustices around reading instruction um, in our, in the history, in our history, our current history, including how I taught kids how to read. Um, but it's, it's the, what's important is that we are on the right track here in Easton. And I'm very proud of that. Um, because I feel that we are going to see a huge difference in, in what our children are, how our children are, are succeeding and becoming successful in school, which includes, um, which includes engagement as well. I also want to share with you, uh, a while ago, you all approved a contract to work with New Solutions K-12. Uh, we just had a planning meeting with them this week with middle school and high school around scheduling. Uh, it really was a remarkable meeting. Um, just having both groups together, we looked at what are some of the what are some of the pri the trends that we see, and we focused on prioritizing what what um, our focus would be. Uh, they did an exercise where we we actually noted the growth of uh, I'm sorry the impact versus the effort it would take. Um, it was great to see we were all very on, very much so on the same page. Uh, prioritizing what we want to focus on in the future and everyone was very similar with what where they thought the priority should be um, so that's that's really fantastic so 
um, in the next in the next couple years, you should see you should see some changes occurring and brought forth to you um, for approval. So just just know that we're, this is all the back work that's happening um, going you know moving forward with that. We have coming up the we're going to be starting that same process with the special ed audit. So um, more information to come on that. Um, I also wanted to let you know, you know, uh, as we're going through these budget meetings, our director of curriculum and EL slash ML, um, and I say that because we are really trying within the district to change the terminology from English learners to multi-language learners. Uh, we, you know, English learners, I think that term comes, shows that there's some, some deficit, but yet in, on the other side, students that speak, speak multiple languages actually is a huge asset to them. So we are in transition, we are in transition for that, from that term from EL to ML. And um, uh, so Ann Weintraub as our director of curriculum and, and director of EL ML, um, she has been doing a remarkable job really bringing the sense of urgency around our, our multi-language learners um, throughout the district. As Leisha noted before, you know, we have just within this week gained more um, multi-language learners, and we are over that hundred threshold, which now does not. Uh, we are not no longer a low incident district. Um, what more information will come on that? But she's done a remarkable job at educating our cabinet around the sense of urgency, um, really looking at the services our students or lack of services our students are receiving not by the people, the people that are servicing our students are remarkable, but the actual quantity of services that they're getting is really struggling, or we're really struggling with that, as well as um, the curriculum that we're using. So we're taking a deeper look at that as well. And I just wanna give a shout out to Ann because she's she's been remarkable in just six months of taking on this position. So we already are seeing the, the fantastic, fantastic difference. Um, and then I just wanted to share with you a little bit about something that I've become involved with. So as you know, earlier this year, I was invited to go to Panama. Um, and at that time, I connected with an organization called World Savvy, which really sparks my interest in um, global competency and how to ensure that our students are graduating with, um, with becoming globally com competent and also how are we globally competent learners. Um, I was invited to attend a series of professional development. Um, it's called Leadership for Complex Times. And I had my first session this last week. Um, I'm collaborating with educators throughout the country from Colorado, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona. Um, and we are working on, we're, we're helping each other navigate um, this difficult time in history we're um, receiving professional learning and we're, we're going to be using toolkits, uh, resources, looking at research and data, um, creating templates for presentations to empower um, our, our, our districts and, and our students within our districts. Um, it's The group is being facilitated by KK Nyman, who's a director of professional learning at World Savvy, and also Dr. William um, uh, Gadelli who is the Dean of College of Education at Lehigh University. I know, I'm branching out outside of uh, Boston College, can you believe it? Um, but but uh, you know, it's, it's, I was so rejuvenated um, after that, just that one session, it was really remarkable. I've actually already started using the data in some of the conversations I've had with people, which has really sparked wonderful conversations. Um, but as we get you know, further along with it, we'll really start talking about um, what we're going to do with this information and how it applies to to the work here in Easton. Uh, lastly, I promise I'm, uh, it's just there's so much going on. I just want to really make sure that you're aware. Um, coming ahead is um, we are going to be organizing a committee to review bullying procedures within the district. Um, this is something that we need to do every three years, and um, that that committee will be. Um, will comprise educators, um, students, families, community members. So more information to come on that, but that is something that we are looking to be doing, you know, starting the committee um, within the next um, couple of months so that we can really get, so, get some good work done. And on, 
on the back side of that also, I've been speaking a lot with the assistant principals on creating a workshop around bullying for families. And I really think that it's, it would be a valuable um, workshop to have, even if people can't attend, we can video it, we can put it on our website, um, you know, or video it, record it, uh, and put it on our website so that, so that really we have a place to direct families to go to. There's lots of questions around bullying, um, lots of uh, wonderful conversations and dialogues we've had with families around what what constitutes bullying legally and what doesn't. Um, and and um, so I just wanted you to be aware that we are, that is in our thoughts, it is it is on the forefront of all we are doing and it is, it is we will be getting things done and I will be bringing that to you. Um, and then I think that's it. There was something that just popped in my head but it popped right back out and I didn't write it down so, um, so yeah. Jackie? Thanks, Mrs. Perrette. That's a lot of information. Um, on the bullying, are you going to be sending out, when you get ready to form these committees, are you going to be sending out emails to parents? How is that going to work? Yes, I will be sending out emails to parents. Even if you know they can't attend, I just want to make sure that they're updated on the process um, and you know how we're going to choose parents to represent, uh, to be representatives on the committee. Um, I think it's really important. I want to be very transparent in the process, um, and I want people to be able to ask questions and, you know, provide input even if they're not able to be on the committee. Um, sometimes schedules don't permit, or we can't have. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, we can't have so many. Um, we can't have a hundred people on the committee. Um, otherwise, we won't get the work done. But right. I definitely want to make sure that their voices are heard and and um, their input is is put into. I mean, I think the workshop is a is a really great idea too. Um, so even like you said, for parents that can't necessarily participate in the committee, you might even get some information from them through the workshops. Yes. I mean, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, school committee notes. Uh, Caroline, do you have anything? No, I don't think so tonight. Thank you. All right. Um, Jackie? Nothing tonight. Thank you. Nancy? Hello. I have things. Um, last night, the I think it was, it was a Tuesday night, uh, the National Junior Honor Society was inducted at the Eastern Middle School. I wasn't able to attend. Maybe some of you are going to talk about it, but uh, it's quite an accomplishment for our eighth graders to do the work that's needed to be inducted into that society and um, congratulations to all of them. Um, the Hall of Fame um, at OA, they have a new display on Tuesday, March 14th at six o'clock in the gym atrium. They'll be unveiling uh, the new um, display. And I believe that the members of the Hall of Fame, people that had plaques up are going to be there and they get their plaques to bring home. Um, the naming subcommittee met um, Wednesday and we have um, a, a new committee. We can still take some more people. So if anybody's interested, they can. We have um, Michelle and myself, Caroline agreed to stay on as a member. She's going to be a town's person member. And we have Andrea Stajewski and uh, Arthur Despina. So thank you very much to everybody for um, getting on the naming subcommittee. Our next meeting will be May 3rd. Um, and then the policy subcommittee, um, we just got some changes from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. So Jackie and I will be reviewing those changes to either update, I guess there's some to eliminate or add or whatever. So we'll go over those policies because it's very important that we do that. And the day of kindness in honor of um, that, that they do, that, I'm sorry. Seven Ness. Right, that they do for the seniors um, every year is going to be on April 27th. So that's something to look forward to. It's such a wonderful day for our seniors, but also for the Ness family and actually for every place in town that these kids go and help, it's awesome. Um, and that is all that I have. Thank you. 
Nancy, a quick question. Yes. I could have just sort of blanked out for a second, but did you mention Elizabeth Starr as joining the name? Oh, subcommittee? I have her name right there, Elizabeth Starr. Thank you. I yeah, have her name written down and I missed it. Thank you. She's a wonderful teacher at the high school and she'll be a great addition. She is. Thank you, Caroline. See, I need, you can't leave. I need you to keep it <laughs> Great. Uh, Jen? Okay, I have things too. Uh, Michelle, did you want me to cover music? Yeah, okay. All right, so I guess we'll we'll start with music. There's a lot going on in the uh, in the the OA and EMS uh, music world with competition season. So um, so over the past couple of weeks and coming up over the next few weeks, uh, there are a lot of opportunity for our student musicians and ensembles to compete in the um, SEMSBA festivals the MAJE festivals, um, the OA jazz bands competed last week in the MAJE festivals, uh, MAJE festival and one, um, one of the bands uh, placed silver, another band placed gold and will move on to a state final later this month. The show choir has a festival um, coming up this weekend, I believe. Um, and oh, nope, the following weekend. Um, and then, of course, the musical will be um, the 17th, 18th, and 19th. So very excited about going to see Footloose. Um, let's see, elsewhere in arts, this weekend at Patriot Place, um, our OA art students will have, <laughs> will have their artwork on display, um, and that can be viewed Friday, Saturday, Saturday or Sunday. Um, let's see sports. Um, this will be a big update because we had so many teams competing in the postseason over the past couple of weeks. So the winter sports season is done. Meet the coaches for spring happened this week. Tryouts will happen later in the month for spring sports. But to wrap up um, a very successful winter season, um, the wrestling team made it to the D2 state tournament. Senior Jaden Hinton placed eighth in the state in his weight class, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, uh, Chris Gaskell from the ski team made it to the MIAA Berkshire East Alpine Championships. Um, the cheer, uh, winter cheer team had a, um, a Hockamock League competition, um, indoor track, so <coughs> many athletes and relay teams competing and placing that I, I can't name them all, um, but we did have um, one student uh, placed fourth in the state um, in the one mile and the girls um, one of the girls relay teams finished third in the state. Um, and then there are some students who moved on to the all New England meet as well. Um, let's see, gymnastics. Um, the gymnastics team won the Hockamock championship and competed in the South sectional finals. I actually went to watch that. It was, um, it was a really fun afternoon. Kudos to any parents of meat based sports where you have to pretty much spend half a day to a full day there. Um, that, that is certainly a major commitment, but uh, there was a, a good cheering squad um, out to watch the gymnastics team. And one of our gymnasts um, had her music stop in the middle of her floor routine and just kept on going. Didn't miss a beat, literally didn't miss a beat. So uh, very impressive. Um, and one of the gymnasts made it to the state individual meet. So congratulations. And then girls basketball and boys hockey both made it to the first round of the playoffs and then wrapped up their season. So congratulations all winter sports. Um, and then I think a couple of other things, told you this was a big update. Um, Katie Greer last week came and spoke to the high school students um, as she had done, I think it was the middle school or middle yeah, school, middle mm -hmm. school preview earlier in the year and then did a parent presentation at night. Um, so I attended the parent presentation and, you know, learned something new every single time I see her. So um, thank you for bringing her to the district again. It's really valuable information. And then next week, um, EMS has its Night of the Arts on Thursday the 16th, which is also the same uh, day as kindergarten, kindergarten orientation meeting. Um, so, I, you know, hopefully anybody watching who has somebody going into kindergarten has gotten that uh, notice. And then um, if they haven't, they, just show up at Blanche Ames. It's very, very important orientation night. Yeah. And what's what's do you know the time off the top of your head? I can look at the calendar Not off the top of my head, but I'll check the calendar. Look at, it's 630 to 730 Thank at you. Blanche Ames on Thursday, the 16th. 
And then the last thing I have is that the, uh, or two last things, um, MASC is having a division three meet and greet later this month, which I do plan on attending. And um, hopefully we can meet some of our colleagues from the area if anybody can go and continue the work of advocating at the state level for our priorities. Um, I, I know Jackie attended the MASC lunch and learn last week. I don't know if anybody else was able to attend as well, but they went over legislative priorities and, um, it, you know, MASC represents a, a large and diverse swath of districts. So, um, so what, you know, what gets advocated for at the state, at the organization state level may not necessarily be what our district needs. Um, so I think we can work together with our, um, our local, our colleagues in, in other towns uh, around here to work with our legislative delegations on advancing um, legislation that will benefit us. And that echoes, finally, I'll wrap up with, it was really great to go to the MASS breakfast yesterday and to see um, Dr. Cabral's leadership in action. Um, she's clearly very well respected among her peers and represented Easton well. Um, and I saw it within the room, it was, I think, I think it was a valuable education session for those who attended. Um, you could see some light bulb moments going off because, you know, the narrative that gets out in the press around the Student Opportunity Act and, uh, and other things that sound really great, but don't necessarily help Easton um, getting out that information that there are a lot of districts like us that don't benefit from the SOA in the same way that many of the larger districts do. So I think it was some good light bulb moments and hopefully will we'll help advance um, some of those legislative agenda items that will benefit us financially in the long run. And I'll stop talking, okay. <laughs> I think you beat Chrissy on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that is that, so. I am going to make a motion um, to enter into executive session and we will return to open session for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining for unit A to comply with open meeting law to review minutes of a prior executive session 2-2-2023. Two, 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 uh, Do I have a second? O'Neill second. All right, roll call vote. O'Neill yes. Durant, yes. Haruka, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. All right, and we will be back.
see it's coming back, right? Uh, the last order of business is the minutes. Um, I would like to get a motion to accept the revised January 19th, 2023 regular school committee minutes. O'Neill, so moved. Can I get a second? Second. Uh, second. Roll, call. roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. Luca, yes. Watson, yes. Star, yes. All right, thank you. So next up is the regular school committee meeting minutes from Thursday, February 16th, 2023. Any questions, comments? Jen? Uh, two small edits um, on the top of page two. First line, I believe that should read um, 4-0, not 5-0. And then um, in the next paragraph down, um, the so the next paragraph, the second line up from the bottom, I believe that is supposed to be Appian Way, which I think is spelled A-P-P-I-A-N. Um, but let me just quickly Google that. Yeah, A-P-P-I-A-N. And that was it. Okay. Anyone else? Can I get a motion to accept the regular school committee meeting minutes from Thursday, February 16th, 2023 with the noted edits? Star, so moved. Wiseman, second. Roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. Luca, abstain. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Next up is the executive session minutes from... Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. Um, I am looking for um, an emotion to either approve with noted edits and release or approve with noted edits and not release at this time. Wiseman, approve with noted edits, edits and not release at this time. Can I get a second? Star Are second. You? Roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. Luca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Excellent. And the last ones are the executive session minutes from Thursday, February 16th, 2023. Does anyone want me to hold them for edits, comments? And I get a motion to either approve and release or approve and not release at this time the executive session meeting minutes from Thursday, February 16th, 2023. Wasman so moved, uh, approve and not release at this time. We got a second. O'Neill second. Roll we'll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. DeLuca, abstain. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Okay. And that is it for minutes. So before we adjourn, our, our next meeting is March 23rd, 2023 at 5 o'clock. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Star, so moved. A second. O'Neill, second. Roll call vote. O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. Luca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. All right. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you, everybody. Night. Bye -bye. Good night.